Well, thank you for inviting me here tonight. This is such a great university, and I always love being here. But I have to admit, while I love being here, it was tough getting here. <laughs> getting here is always a challenge, and I can't always rely on transit to get me here on time. Actually, these days, it's hard to rely on any kind of transportation to get you anywhere on time, here or anywhere else in the city. Traffic and gridlock happens at all times of the day, and it's getting worse in Toronto. It's getting harder and harder to get around. We now have gridlock both on our roads and on our transit system. Gridlock is a universal term here in Toronto. We are getting too used to this word, gridlock. Now, I don't need to convince you of that because you live it every day, whether it's on Finch or on Keel. Uh, everyone who is a student or a member of faculty or staff member at York know this all too well, as we've just heard. Now, to state the obvious, it takes dedication to get here. And I salute you for being here tonight and for bringing such a strong and positive focus to this vital issue. I also thank you for creating a format that will allow us to have a dialogue, a meaningful dialogue later on. Of course, good luck is on everyone's mind in Toronto these days. I am sure everyone in this room has their own horror stories. That is, gridlock stories, all the missed opportunities, missing a class, missing an exam, being late for work, having to reschedule a dinner, missing a movie downtown or a hockey game, and heaven forbid, even missing a date. We all have our horror stories. And all those missed opportunities, lost time, time that you can never get back, those missed opportunities make a difference in our daily lives. They make a difference to our well-being, our quality of life, and our pocketbooks. And just multiply those missed opportunities by all the students here at York, all the faculty, and all your families, and everyone in Toronto, and people across Canada. In lost productivity alone, gridlock here in the greater Toronto area is costing us six billion dollars a year. Six billion dollars. It adds up to way over 10 billion dollars across this country. Out the window, up in smoke, or should I say up in smog. We're missing the bus, absolutely. Good luck is costing our urban economies a tremendous amount of money. That adds up to real financial, social, and personal loss. For every person in this city, for businesses large and small, for the economy, and for this country. And that's not even counting the environmental costs, the carbon emissions. It's not counting the health costs, the stress costs, the road rage, the traffic accidents, the frustration, the disappointment that stress inside us as we are stuck in jams or waiting for the bus, or even can't even get in the, onto the bus because it's too jam-packed. So counting the human costs, think about it. The burden on families who just don't have enough time to be together because people have to spend so much time commuting. And just think of what a difference it could make if we have fast, reliable, and accessible public transit. Just imagine that. Think what a difference it could make to your quality of life, to your academic life, to your social life. Think of all the people that you can hang out with, the sleep that you can have, that you are missing now. And think of what a difference it could make to your weekly budget, to the air you breathe, to the stress you feel. And think what a difference it could make to York University. 
Think what a difference it could make to your families, to the economy, and to the environment. And the cost will not just be carried by your generation. The lack of investment today and the pollution created today will cost dearly the generations to come, your kids and your grandkids. I love the your32.com campaign, 32campaign.com, do you know what that is? What you can do with 32 minutes extra per day. Imagine that, what can you do? Wow, a lot of things you can do with 32 minutes. And uh, that is only if we can break the gridlock if we invest in public transit and get moving. And you and I know it's getting worse. Here in Toronto, we have the worst, worst traffic gridlock in North America, one of the top five. Worse than Los Angeles, worse than New York, worse than Vancouver, worse than Montreal. This is our home, this is Toronto. How did we get this way? And for a city our size, we have a sadly inadequate transit system. I had a graphic on my Facebook page a while ago with the maps of the subway systems in New York, London, Paris, and Toronto. And it told a really powerful story. Just picture it. Compared to all the other cities, Toronto transit system is not even on the map. It's not even on the map, seriously. We outgrew our system years ago when our population was just half the size right now. This is hurting everyone. Businesses, industries, families, senior students, it's hurting Toronto, it is hurting Canada. This is a local issue, but it is also regional and national. And we need more than local solutions. It will take solutions at all levels. It will take cooperations at all levels, and it will take leadership at all levels. But the missing link has been national leadership. You hear a lot of talk right now about what's happening in Toronto, Metrolink, all of that discussion. But did you hear much about federal involvement? Not really. This is a national crisis, and it is a national issue, and we need national leadership. It is fundamental, and it is important. Yet here, in this great university, in this great city of Toronto, in this great country, we are mired in gridlock, political gridlock. We're missing the bus. We're falling behind. We're falling behind the rest of the world, and yet, despite the fact that this is a serious national issue that has become critical, we still have no national transit strategy. No plan. Can you believe this? No plan at all. All other G8 countries have a national transit strategy, not Canada. Most have predictable and long-term capital funding, not Canada. Most have transit-related research and development funding. Well, not Canada. Most have recognized the central importance of transit in this day and age as a national priority, but still not Canada. We're, fall, we're failing to invest where it counts and is costing us. Everyone here knows that we can do better. We must do better. And what we need is resolve and leadership. What we need is planning, long-term planning, because major transit projects require major funding and they take years to complete. It just takes a long time to dig that hole and move that hole and fill that hole. And Toronto does not have the funding capacity, nor do other municipalities. Why? The municipal share of taxes is just eight cents of every dollar, eight cents. Not enough to fund major capital programs. The federal government, meanwhile, collects almost half of your taxes. Just GST alone in Toronto is $3 billion, okay? And then it doles it out piecemeal, 
little piece by little piece, without an overall vision, and sometimes in a partisan way. And that's not right. In the last go around, Toronto did not get anything remotely approaching a fair share of desperately needed federal infrastructure funding. Why? Not that they hate Toronto, but because the infrastructure funding from the federal government was based on a two-year cycle. And it's very susceptible to political influence. Only short-term projects got funding. That's why the request for new streetcars was rejected, because it takes more than two years to order the streetcar, make the streetcar, deliver the streetcar, and test them. So Toronto was left out in the cold. We didn't get a penny of the federal dollars to buy streetcars. Now, mind you, they came to the ribbon cutting, that's OK. But we didn't get the money, because it's that, that funding formula is only for two years. So without a national transit strategy, what do we get? We dug a hole in Eckington Subway. Some of you may remember, in Eckington. They dug a hole. Seriously, we did. Then we filled it in. We didn't build the Eckington Subway back then. We dug the hole. We filled it in. Ran out of, didn't have the money. And then we dug it again. Seriously, you know how much money it costs? Millions of dollars. How many years of, of waste did, did it, uh, you know, of, of wasted time? So this is what happens when we don't have a plan. We just end up wasting time, wasting money. We just talk and talk and argue and subways, light rapid transit, back and forth. And yet, we still don't have an overall subway system or light rapid transit system yet. So I believe we need a five-point plan. Number one, a plan that makes funding long-term and predictable. We need better than a two-year cycle. We need a 20-year cycle. That's how long it takes to develop and maintain and build a transit system. 20 years, not two years. Two, we need a plan that has clear criteria and set clear targets. Targets like cutting specific commute time. And then specific actions that plan, that specific action plans to achieve those, tar those targets. Because what gets measured gets managed, it gets results, and then it gets built. Three, we need a plan where funding grows with non-political measures such as economic growth, population growth, ridership growth. Because if you don't project that, if you don't build it in on the funding uh, formula or the program, then 10 or 20 or 40 years later, we are back into the same place. We're going to keep arguing about funding, who's going to pay what, and we'll be mired in political gridlock again. Four, we need a plan based on partnership amongst jurisdiction. So funding can lever provincial, municipal, and private sector funding, including various revenue tools that are being debated right now by City of Toronto and Metro, uh, Metro Links. Those tools could, be, uh, could include road pricing, it could be tolls, it could be any number of things. But we shouldn't just ask the user to pay. What about the taxes we pay? Shouldn't we get some of that back to Toronto? Number five, we need a plan that encourages innovation, efficiency, and sustainability. If we can have Electric trains that are better for the environment, why don't we use it? If we could have energy uh, reducing, like for example, in Calgary or in Edmonton, they power their, their RTs uh, by solar and, and by the wind, okay? It, by, because they have windmills right beside it. And if that's what they do, maybe they're, it may not work here, but at least we should look at best practices across the country. So those are the five points. Long-term, predictable funding, 
It, grow, it needs to grow with economics and political and, uh, and population growth. Number three, set clear targets so we get measured, get managed. Number four, make sure that we can lever other levels of government so there's really a partnership. And number five, encourage innovation, efficiency, and sustainability. We need all these elements in a national plan with a national partnership and national leadership because that's where our money goes and it is the federal government. To end the gridlock in Toronto and Vancouver and Montreal and across the country, we have to end the gridlock in Parliament. To get Canada moving, to get the country moving, we have to get Parliament moving. We have to get Mr. Harper and the Conservatives moving. A major reason why I ran as a member of Parliament and went to Ottawa was to get the issues of our city and of all cities onto the national agenda to work on the national solutions to urban issues. In the last two years, I've met with mayors and councillors from big cities and small towns, whether it is Mount Pearl or Calgary or Vancouver or Victoria or Surrey, BC or Halifax. I am grateful that they are supporting my national transit strategy bill that I introduced in Parliament quite a, about a year and a half ago, and it got support from Chambers of Commerce, Board of Trade, unions, business groups, environmental groups, different political parties, city councils and town councils, First Nations from east to west and north and south. It's just from coast to coast to coast, um, we had support, including the urban transit authorities and the Federation of Canadian Municipalities that represent 2,000 municipal governments across Canada. We also gained support from different political parties. Liberals, Bloc and Greens, they all supported the bill. So there was widespread support. But then you might ask, what happened to your bill, Ms. Chow? We got widespread support except from Mr. Harper and the Conservatives. They weren't ready yet. Okay? So I didn't win by, with that vote. I didn't quite get enough votes. But the good news is, it's a new year. It's, there's new opportunity and more public pressure than ever for action to end the gridlock and get Canada moving. That's the good news. The next opportunity is in the government's hands. They can take the lead themselves, not my private members bill, they can do it themselves, and meet the needs of Canadians by addressing the vital national issues. How? Well, the 2013 national federal budget is coming up. They're putting it together. It is about to come sometime in March or April. And I'm pleased to say that working with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and the Mid City Mayor Caucus, we were able to persuade the Minister of Transport and Infrastructure to commit to a new infrastructure plan in the upcoming budget. That's good. Because earlier on, they weren't sure that's what they're going to do. This is incredibly important because the existing program is expiring and municipalities will miss a construction season if the new program is not in place. So the Federation of Canadian Municipalities is pushing for a long-term and predictable funding program that will set us on to the right track. We need to make sure the minister's commitment turns into real allocation of funds and real action. So there's this unique opportunity. That old program is almost gone. Something new has to replace it. How we design this new program will impact on your lives, will impact on everyone's life. It will give us an indication whether we can, in fact, end gridlock or not. So the timing is just perfect. For Canadian families, this is more than time lost if we don't do anything. In, addressing, in, in addition to addressing gridlock, 
Let's remember that every billion dollars invested in infrastructure creates 11,000 jobs. So not only is it good for ending gridlock, it's actually good for creating jobs. It spur economic growth. This week, I wrote to Mayor Ford and Toronto City Councilors, as well as mayors and councilors across the country, asking them to join with FCM, Federation of Canadian Municipalities, and all of us in pushing for this funding. I'm encouraged to hear that Premier-elect Kathleen Wynne talking about investing in transit in her first week on the job. That's a good sign. That's a very encouraging sign. Tonight, I'm asking you to help make sure that our voice, your voices, are heard and that Canada's needs are met. I'm asking you to keep the pressure on. We need all of you to take action. Show your support. Sign the iHeartPublicTransit.ca uh, little pledge. I think there's pledge cards here. Our volunteers are here if you want to sign. Talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, write to your member of parliament, write to the prime minister, send me a copy so that I can gauge how strong our movement is, and spread the word, mobilize, get moving. It can be done. Together we can move Canada forward with fast, reliable, accessible transit. We can end the gridlock and we can get moving. And don't ever let anybody tell you that it cannot be done. So let's start, let's get moving, let's put the pressure on, the time is now. Thank you very, very much.